What happened to these girls? What happened to your ex-wife? What did you do with them? Are you accusing me that I killed them? Or... I'm accusing you of murder, Donnie, and I want to know what happened. Did I personally kill them? You would answer, what, what's this? With, with a knife or whatever? You are going to be booked for okay. a triple murder. Do it. That way. Do it. You're trying to tell me you have nothing to do with it. This guy is My friend, stupid. you're done. It's very you're stupid. done. I came to this location on a uh, follow-up on a missing persons report. Detective John Lynch is looking for three people. Mother and her two teenage daughters who had basically fallen off the face of the earth. 37-year-old Lucy Mussina and her daughters Edith and Gabriella were reported missing by a friend the day after Thanksgiving. And this was the last location that they were known to be at. Detective Lynch enters Mussina's apartment and finds it empty except for a few small signs of foul play. And checking the carpet, uh, I noticed a uh, brownish red, which potentially could have been blood. Uh, I then noticed around the baseboards, around the door and the, uh, the floorboard area, there were uh, what appeared to be blood spatter marks. Detectives saw or noticed a very large uh, red-brown stain. Steve Renteria is a criminalist with the LA County Crime Lab. Uh, in the closet, they showed me a stain that pretty much took up the whole area of the interior of the closet. Renteria runs chemical tests on the stain and determines it to be human blood. After that, the detectives uh, pointed out a certain area in the second bedroom. In this area here was the uh, second stain, about four inches in diameter. The second stain also tests positive for human blood. Renteria decides to coat the apartment with luminol. We started in this bedroom and we sprayed the entire carpet area. Uh, obviously the area where there was blood gave a positive result, but then we started noticing a trail or a path about two feet wide that came from that blood stain through the doorway, a continuous reaction all the way down the hallway, and it looped around all the way back into the closet where the larger stain was located. My gut feeling is somebody probably bled out and, and somebody either had died or was near death, but without doing any scientific experiments as far as how much blood volume it would have to take to see that pattern, we weren't really able to say that to the detective, but, but inside I knew something bad had really happened. We didn't really uh know if we had their true names. Uh, Detective Lynch's missing persons case is beginning to look more and more like homicide, a matter further complicated by the fact that Lucy Musino and her daughters are undocumented aliens. Again, no relatives uh, on uh, Lucy's side at all. We found no one that was interested in these people besides their friends. Lynch's only lead is Lucy's live-in boyfriend, Estanislao Gonzalez. At the time of the disappearance, Gonzalez was seen packing up and moving out of the apartment by the building manager. She was real surprised by this because uh, he had signed a year lease for this place. And uh, less than a week later, he's moving out. So she asked him what was going on. And uh, he said, well, we're not getting along. And she's going back to Mexico, and I'm, I'm leaving. Detectives are unable to locate Gonzalez. In 1994, Forensic technology cannot identify the blood found in the closet. And so the investigation hangs in limbo. You have to prove that a crime has occurred. And uh, we weren't able to show that from the blood that we had at the time and the technology at the time, we could only show that that was human blood. You know, we suspected who it belonged to, but uh, we, we just still have to prove it. This is the cold case homicide room of the Downey Police Department. Sergeant Jim Elsasser is closing in on retirement when he decides to take a shot at one of Downey PD's most puzzling cases. We had no idea where the suspects were, and maybe the biggest stumbling blocks is we had no idea where the bodies were. We just had three missing persons with a lot of blood, evidence at the scene that we were unable to analyze. Like many in the department, Elsasser suspects Lucy Musino and her daughters are dead and that the key to the case 
lies with Musina's boyfriend, Estanislao Gonzalez. I knew that there was a good likelihood that this man had killed those children. And when I was doing my investigation on it, I ended up getting photographs of these girls, eight by 11 photographs. And I, and I had one for each child. And every time you get a little tired and discouraged or something, you look at the pictures of these children and you just realize, hey, you know, this guy killed him and he's getting away with it and he's got away with it for five years. And I was gonna do what I could do to uh, find him. On the morning of September 9th, 1999, Sergeant El Sasser sits down at a computer terminal and begins to search for a Stanislao Gonzalez. Six hours later, he develops a lead. I ran his vehicle identification number, and I ran it through USDMV, which is a, uh, we can get license information from all across the United States. And even though his license plates no longer were on file, the VIN came up and he had just registered that vehicle in Las Vegas. El Sasser gets on the phone with Las Vegas police, who are able to confirm Gonzalez's whereabouts. They did a stakeout on the house. They saw him come home. They saw his vehicle. I knew he was there. Finding Gonzalez is one thing, building the case for murder quite another. We're at the LA County Sheriff's Department Crime Lab where we analyzed evidence in the Gonzalez case. By 1999, DNA technology is advancing rapidly and bringing detectives ever closer to identifying the blood found at the scene of the disappearance. This is the blood stain that we found in the second bedroom. A lot of these cases that, that we get, uh, if we don't get results right away, some of these cases, in fact, most of them, we always have uh, in our back of our mind you know, if a, a future technology develops, uh, this might be a good case to bring back out. This is the under padding. In fact, in this particular case, uh, I had portions of the carpet actually in my work area all the way back from 1994. And on a daily basis, I would actually see them in my work area. And it would remind me that when this new technology was in place and we were able to do it, that this would be a perfect case to do uh, future work. The results we got from Bloodstain 1, which was from the closet, and Bloodstain 2, which was from the bedroom number 2, told us that uh, the two different bloodstains originated from two different individuals, that they were related to each other, and that they were from two females. The blood of two related females, sisters perhaps, or a mother and daughter. The results are consistent with foul play and the disappearance of Lucy Musino and her daughters, but not specific enough to be conclusive. Anytime you try to prove a homicide with no bodies, that's a difficult case. In the fall of 1999, Jim Elsesser retires after 30 years on the job, and the disappearance of Lucy Musino and her daughters once again goes cold. Bottom line is, uh, city of Downey, we have uh, 100 plus thousand people. We have three people working robberies, homicides, and they're extremely busy. And we have robberies all the time. I know one year we had 19 homicides, and cold case files get a backseat sometimes to active cases. It will take a new round of DNA testing and a fresh set of cold case detectives to turn up the heat on this Stanislaw Gonzalez. Are you accusing me that I killed him? Or I'm accusing you of murder, Tony, and I want to know what happened. I first looked at this case in June of 2001. Detective Gil Toledo is reviewing cold cases when he comes across the 1994 disappearance of Lucy Musino and her two daughters, Edith and Gabriela. It was very intriguing. No bodies, and these people had been missing for several years. By 2001, detectives have developed DNA profiles from a trail of blood found in the apartment. The two different blood stains originated from two different individuals. They were related to each other, and they were from two females. So we wanted to try to identify them, and one way was to locate a, uh, a relative that uh, could provide us with some DNA through blood or saliva to uh, compare with the blood we found in the apartment. And what we learned after talking to the investigators that there were two uh, living children from the missing mother that were possibly with the suspect in Las Vegas. The suspect in Las Vegas is Estanislao Gonzalez. 
Gonzalez fathered two of Musino's four children and abruptly skipped town with them when Lucy went missing. And we told the detectives if they would be able to get a sample from those two living children, we would be able to compare the genetic profile from those children to the bloodstains found at the crime scene. And it would tell us, number one, if one of them could be the mother of the living children. And by default, the second stain would possibly be the daughter to that particular mother. Downey detectives pack up and head for Vegas, gambling on a hunch that saliva samples from Lucy Musino's children will help unlock the mystery of her disappearance. We came to the trailer and we decided to knock on the door and use a ruse that we were Child Protective Services. Linda Turner is a detective in Las Vegas, called in by Downey PD to help make contact with Estanislao Gonzalez and his children. He was very cooperative. He told us that we could look around his trailer, that we could talk to him, that we could talk to the kids. And I began questioning him about uh, the conditions of the mobile home, uh, the, the, the children, whether they're, they're attending school regularly. Normal questions that a social worker following up on something like this would normally ask. The trailer was dirty. There was food, but it was very disorganized. There was dog feces inside the trailer. I asked him, well, by the way, where's the mother of these children? And he appeared extremely startled. And we asked them, where is your mother at? And I remember the twins just staring at us kind of blankly. They said they didn't have a mother. And I asked them if they remembered their mother. They said they did not. I asked questions about what happened to her. He said that she left him long ago. I asked her if he knew where she was. He indicated that he didn't. He really wanted to avoid that line of questioning. Gonzalez doesn't give up any new information, but detectives come away from the meeting with a connection they had hoped for. And I pretty much laid the groundwork for a follow-up that I was gonna come back in the near future to check the children's health, make sure they're okay, they're being fed, they're going to school. And that was the time we were planning on, on actually getting the uh, saliva sample from the kids away from him. So we knew the twins came here every day after school. Two weeks later, detectives re-established contact with Gonzalez's children at the local Boys and Girls Club. So we came here, told the twins we needed to do a health check on them. They remembered us. Um, they were very cooperative. And we took one swab from the female and one swab from the male. Back in L.A. County, Steve Renteria compares the children's DNA to profiles developed from the bloodstains found at the suspected crime scene. What we found out was the DNA results from the two living children were consistent with being the natural children of the bloodstain we found in closet number one. So by doing that, we were able to establish that that is where the mother bled out in that particular crime scene. Cold case detectives believe they know where Lucy Musino died. Now they prepare to take down the man they suspect killed her. At that point, we were excited. I mean, we were, we were jumping out of our seats, wanting, wanting to go down there, and, and, and you know, obviously, as investigators, we want to arrest this guy and get him off the streets as fast as we can. Before making an arrest, detectives place a wiretap on Gonzalez's phone and approach his sister, Delia Mora, in hopes of stirring the pot. We asked her if she had seen or spoke to her um, brother, whether she knew the whereabouts of Luz Musino and the girls, and she denied any knowledge of them. We had a team, a surveillance team, on her uh, watching the house, and immediately, uh, within minutes, she packed up her car with another male, got on the freeway, and drove maybe about 20, 25 minutes out of where they lived. Detectives keep a tail on Mora as she pulls off the freeway and gets on a payphone. The team that was watching her called us and said, hey, she's on a painful right now, she may be calling her a guy. Sure enough, uh, our guy's in the wire call, said, hey, we got a call coming in. Hello? Hello? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Cómo estás? Soy yo, Delia. Oye, este mm. no, estamos todos bien, fíjate. Nomás que hay muy malas noticias. Malas noticias. Ay. Sí, quiero que te sientes y que te relajes. Mira, Danilo, este, vinieron hoy a mi casa. Yo no sé cómo dieron con mi teléfono, con mi, con mi, con mi dirección, unas personas de homicidio en el cual andan buscando a Lucy... A Gabby y a Eddie. There was a, a pause in his uh, conversation 
almost again as if, if it sounded if he was startled. He didn't know how to respond to it. Pruebas dice, dice evidence muy contundentes, dice, dice que tienen evidencias. No sé si estos babosos imbéciles quieren asustarme para quitarte a los niños, por eso te digo. No sé qué hacer entonces, pero este, yo no sé qué puedo hacer, es, uh, estoy haciendo mi vida aquí lo mejor posible, ya ves, bajo qué condiciones y este, si encima todavía tengo un problema así tan grande. During the conversation she offered to take him to Mexico, help him escape to Mexico. ¿Por qué no te llamo mañana y vamos a pensarlo bien? Tenemos que pensar algo. Si te quieres ir a México, vamos, yo te ayudo. Uh -huh. Pues si es necesario, lo tendría que hacer por los hijos. Once she made contact with him, we were not going to let him out of our sights. We just wanted to see what his reaction would be. With Gonzalez now talking about a run for the border, detectives need to move quickly. We didn't want him to get the children uh, in fear of maybe there may be, if, if we end up trying to take him down, we'd have a hostage situation, or he may even harm the children. Detectives know Gonzalez is headed to the Boys and Girls Club to pick up his children, and that's where they plan to take him down. Gonzalez walked out of the Boys and Girls Club with the twins. He walked towards his car. As soon as he got in the vicinity of his vehicle, we stopped him. When I first mentioned to him that I wanted to talk to him about the disappearance of Luz Musino, like, uh, his jaw dropped and everything came tumbling down on him. He was very startled. Detectives took him away across the parking lot to another vehicle, and my partner and I stayed with the twins as we already had a rapport with them. They were obviously upset seeing their dad being taken away. We stayed with them, comforted them. You are going to be booked on a triple murder. That's fine. Gonzalez is arrested and taken in for questioning. So we're going to deal with it that way. Do it. There, the detectives will find the suspect to be less than contrite. This guy is my friend. You're done. What if I told you that I had evidence that you did something to this woman? Me? Yeah. I don't understand what you're saying. An interview room in Las Vegas. Cold case detectives Gil Toledo and Dwayne Cooper turn up the heat on Estanislaw Gonzalez, a man they suspect of murdering Lucy Musino and her two daughters, Edith and Gabriela. What if I told you that when we went into that apartment, we found evidence of something happening to some people in that apartment? How would you answer that? How would you answer that, Tony? He denied for for the good majority of our interview. I became very accusatory. I, I accused him of murdering them. I want you to tell me what happened, Tani. What happened? I want you to tell me, Tani, because you, you don't want me to tell you what happened? What? I want it to happen with their bodies. What happened to these girls? What happened to your ex-wife? What did you do with them? Are you, are you accusing me that I killed them? Or I'm accusing you of murder, Tani, and I want to know what happened. I laid some things out to make him believe that we had a whole bunch of evidence uh, that would implicate him in these murders. And let me tell you something, you do a lot of things to a body. You burn it, dismember it, do all kinds of things to get rid of a body. But you know what? Tiny minute particles of DNA will still be around. Even if you bury it, we find stuff like that all the time. Tiny. DNA. Three little letters that appear to have a big impact on the suspect's demeanor. We can prove it. Okay, now you can prove that I killed these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I do this with my own hands? Did I kill these people? Yes, you were involved in their murders. He stated, uh, you think I killed them? You think I killed them? While well, he did that, he was motioning in a stabbing manner. Or, or did I personally kill them? You would answer, what, what's this? With, uh, with a knife or whatever? Did you kill him with a knife? Okay. okay. With a gun? We don't know. Huh? I don't know. I mean, you motion like this. What does that mean? Okay, I'm sorry for this. Okay. Why be Next sorry time, I'm gonna go like this, and then you go like this. How about that? You made the okay. motion. Okay. Right? Okay. Well, we are talking about people being murdered. People could be murdered all kinds of different ways. Okay. Why? Why did we go to that? During the point of that interview, he became very angry with me. You're going to apologize to me one day. I'm not going to apologize to you. You're going to apologize? I'm not going to apologize. Unless you tell me. Unless you tell me. What you are doing right now to unless me. Unless you tell me okay. where their mother is. 
Detective Cooper and Toledo had interviewed Gonzalez for over five hours. Dennis Flynn is a detective with the Las Vegas Police Department. As questioning of Gonzalez reaches an impasse, Flynn is called in to transport the suspect to the county jail. Well, the ride to the jail was about a 15 minute drive. Using the opportunity to do a little questioning of his own, Flynn takes on the classic good cop persona. We were both divorced fathers, uh, that we had both had two children. We knew it was like uh, for someone uh, to try to take your children from you. The suggestion that Lucy Messina was attempting to take the twins away seems to strike a chord with Gonzalez. He then started to agree with me that the mere fact that she was gonna take his children, the two twins, away from him, uh, made him, in, the thought of that made him enraged. And he began to, to start to confess. As Gonzalez begins copying to knowledge of the murders, Sergeant Flynn heads back to the police station, back to the interview room. Um, I want to know what uh, you can tell us about this incident. Well, um, we pick up these two guys. He told us that these two workers that he hired to help him move things out of the apartment that day were the ones that actually uh, murdered Luz Musino and the girls. And this, the, the two guys turn back and they push it inside of the uh, apartment. And his story just didn't make sense because he kept uh, giving us some cockamamie reason why they would murder them. Okay, so mm -hmm. you just kind of ignored their screams and in cries, way, for, cries in, for help? In that moment, yes. Okay, so they were crying, they were screaming for help. They were beating beat up. You know something was happening to them, correct? Yeah. And you decided, I didn't want no part of this, I'm leaving with... I'm getting out of here. That's pretty much what happened, right? Gonzalez is trying to spin the facts to minimize his involvement, but can't avoid placing himself at the scene and providing detectives with details only the killer would know. And at this point, you see bodies lying on the ground yes. with blood. Yes. There's yes. blood on the carpet. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you know they've been killed. Okay? At least for us, we got him to admit that these bodies were, in fact, they weren't missing. They were, in fact, dead, murdered and that he was forced to help them clean the bodies up and dispose of them in the, in the riverbed. You're trying to tell me now that they forced you to take them into your van? It's closing in on 10 p.m., and detectives aren't buying Gonzalez's tale of furniture movers turned cold-blooded killers. You know how much sense that makes? Zero. It doesn't make any sense. People aren't that way. And you're saying these guys had held you at bay with a knife and threatened to kill you. They were so concerned about getting those bodies out of that apartment, apartment they have no connection with, apartment that they've never even been to, people you don't even know. They were so concerned about getting these bodies out that they had you drive them 15 minutes away, dump the bodies, and they jumped out with those bodies. Forget about that, okay? We forget. Don't forget about that. Don't forget then. Then go through there. I didn't kill them. I was not present when they were killed. I, I didn't witness anything, okay? I only witnessed my kid. Okay. Okay? And I'm going to tell you something. Yes. You are going to be booked for okay. a triple murder. That's fine. You're involved in that's it. That's fine. And we're going to show it. Okay. Okay? Okay. So we're going to deal with Do it that way. Do it. You okay. already that's face it. it. Do it. Okay? Confess to this whole thing. Confess. Short of saying you killed them, you moved them bodies. You were responsible you're for the body. You, you, you took what you're them out of there. You and dumped saying, the bodies in a riverbed, uh, uh, and you're trying to tell me you had nothing to do with it. This guy is My friend, stupid. you're done. It's very you're stupid. done. Okay. Gonzalez is booked on the triple murder and enters a plea of innocent. As his trial date approaches, however, the suspect has a change of heart. It was a death penalty type case, and uh, his attorney uh, approached this attorney's office and. Eventually, he uh, confessed to the, these murders. In a one-page statement, Estanislao Gonzalez admits to the murders and to dumping the bodies in the Nevada desert. I think that was the biggest surprise of the whole case was when we found out. Details of Gonzalez's confession square with police department records of three Jane Doe's discovered on March 26, 1996. The burial site is... Is right here on this yeah. corner. Uh, Teeth and bone samples from the three Jane Doe's are tested and confirmed 
as belonging to Lucy Musino and her two daughters, Edith and Gabriella. It's bittersweet when I come out here. Today, their bodies rest here at the Palm Cemetery in Las Vegas. I'm happy that they've been identified and they have a final resting place, but it's, it's hard to come out here and know that and you know, she could be with her twins and see them as they grow up, but I'm glad that there's been some kind of resolution to the case and that they finally have some place to be and the twins can come out and they can visit their mom whenever they want to. Lucy Messino's surviving twins are currently living in a foster home in Las Vegas. As for their father, Estanislao Gonzalez, he will be spending the rest of his life in a California prison. told him point blank, I said, look, I know you know where Patty Jo is. I know that you did something to her. And I begged him to please just tell me where she is. And he kept saying, I don't know where she's at. I did not do anything to her. I said, I just want you to have one last thing to remember our family by. And I slapped him so hard, so hard. But that, believe it or not, made me feel so much better. I always keep a picture. Anytime I work an investigation, I keep a picture of the person missing or, or the victim, uh, because you always look back and the person is, just, is not just a number or not just something that fades away. Keith Isom is an investigator in Pittsylvania County, Virginia. He doesn't investigate a lot of homicides, but the ones he does get, he takes personally. It's someone that actually lived and had a family and had thoughts and had breath and now possibly something has happened to them. And so you keep reminding yourself that why you're going forward is for that person that you got that photo. The picture Isom holds close belongs to Patty Jo Pulley. On May 16, 1999, her pickup truck is found abandoned near Highway 62. Patty Jo herself is missing. My first uh, intuition was, well, she met someone and left. I mean, just, just without knowing anything because the truck, the way it was parked. The truck was parked there as if someone was going to come back and get it or as if it was placed there neat and nice, not to have any damage done to it. Patty Jo is about the last person Detective Isom would expect to skip town. Patty Jo, what did you think about this trip? I had a Married to a local pastor, Rick Pulley, she has helped to form a spiritual basis for the community, and on the surface, seems to enjoy a perfect marriage. They were involved in almost every aspect um, of our church. Rick and Patty Joe worked with our worship team, and they worked with our young people. And with the youth ministry, uh, there was a lot of um, uh, outward ministry, mission work. They did a mission trip at least once a year. Randy Sedeth is the lead pastor at Rick Pulley's church. Judy is his wife. In church, she would lay her head on his shoulder. So there was obvious um, affection there. They seemed to be a happy couple. Only concern we would have had would have been that they were maybe too committed to the church ministries and we were trying to get them to uh, rest a little bit more, do some things outside of church, outside of mission. Here on the surface, everything looked fine. Of course, uh, everyone has little problems, but as you begin to look behind the scenes, and that's where you start finding out that everything is not as it appears. 18 hours after Patty Joe went missing, Detective Isom drives to Rick Pulley's home to talk to him about his missing wife. Well, when I first came here, uh, my intention was to give him my card, introduce myself to him, and if there's any way we could be of any assistance, you know, to let us know. And when I saw uh, Mr. Rick Pulley for the first time, that's when I realized the scratches, the wounds on his face, and I realized at that time I needed to take a statement from him. The scratches on Pulley's face are deep and numerous. Rick Pulley claims he fell into a convenient briar patch. This is my toolkit. What started out as a courtesy visit to a concerned husband quickly morphs into a Q&A with a possible suspect. The reason I wanted to tape it was simply because of the marks on his face. At that point, I felt there was a different side of this story, 
And the only way I really knew to get to it was just sit down with him and just, just talk to him, let him talk to me. I'd taken the van and taken her into work so I could take the van and have the tire fixed. The pastor claims he last saw his wife at 6 p.m. on the night she disappeared. Police says he spent the rest of the night at the local high school. Uh, and then he got talked about the play at Dan River High School. What time did you get there for the play? About 7.15, 7 7.20, I think. Had the play started? It started. It already started. It just so happened that night I was at the exact same play. And he didn't know this. Maybe it's coincidence, luck, or perhaps a bit of both. But Isom's own son was in the same school play that night. And the detective was in the audience watching the whole thing. And asking questions about the play, um, how did it end? He began fumbling through it. What was the last scene? I don't remember. You mean the name of it? No. I'm not, I'm what not. happened? What happened up on stage, the last act? Um, the, last, the last act was, was uh, the, the, the lovers finally come together and, and everything is consummated with their relationship. And it, all, it ends with that. It's happy ever after. His final answer was that both couples came together and they live happily ever after, which I knew that wasn't true because one of the characters, main characters in one of the couples dies. The investigator believes Rick Pulley is lying and wonders why. Isom then asks the pastor to take off his shirt. And of course, taking off his shirt, he had a few scratches on his arms that uh, to me consistent with briars. But what really stood out to me was he had some, some scratch marks here on his chest, but also these four elongated bruises on his right bicep. When I looked at the bruises was, uh, was consistent with uh, Patty Joe reaching up, grabbing with her left hand on his right bicep, and him and also reaching up with her right hand and scratching his face. That's why when I looked at that, that's exactly what this picture told me. Detective Isom's suspicion only deepens when a few days later, an eyewitness surfaces. He was walking right, right along this area right here. Robert Rowland is a self-described good old boy. Two days after Patty Joe Pulley disappeared, Rowland tells police about a man he saw near the missing woman's pickup. So uh, when I pulled him and started talking to this fella, he turned and tried to hide from me and looked over his shoulder. Thinking that the man's truck had broken down, Roland stops and offers him a lift. T-shirt was towing, had something hanging down on his side, and it was uh, ripped, you know, looked like a sheet or something like that. Right. And, uh, he told me, he said, I'm all right, I'm all right, just go on, go on. Robert Roland identifies a photograph of Rick Pulley as the man he met on the side of the road. When they showed me the photo, I said, that's the fellow right there. That was the fellow that the photo was shown. That was uh -huh. the fellow you saw seen walking up 62. Yes. Pastor Rick Pulley is now the prime suspect in his wife's disappearance and possible murder. There is, however, still a question of motive. Detective Isom begins that inquiry with a small event that happened the night before Patty Joe Pulley disappeared. Uh, Patty Joe went to Winn Dixie, which is a grocery store here, and she got up to the cash register and wrote a check, and it bounced. They wouldn't take it. So here she is, a dignified woman, a very proud woman, as far as um, a pillar of the community down there where she lives, and they won't take her check. So I'm sure she's very humiliated and embarrassed. Phone records shed light on the source of the couple's money woes. Rick Pulley, it appears, was a sex addict, racking up nearly $1,000 a month in calls to 900 sex lines. You know, we all put on masks and try to present ourselves a certain way in front of everyone else, but once you go behind closed doors, you take the mask off. So at this point is the person that everyone perceived him to be in the community is what he actually was behind closed doors or whether there's another Rick Pulley that no one knew about. It appears the local pastor was leading two lives. The question for investigators, was he willing to kill his wife in order to keep his secret? So they searched the area, trying to find a scent, looking for her or anyone that may have left the truck. Six months after Patty Joe Pulley disappeared, investigator Keith Isom walks the area looking for her remains. We, it's a thing of every night, I lay in bed trying to figure out where she could be. I looked everywhere I knew 
here in Virginia, on this side of the river, along the roads, knowing she was somewhere, somewhere here, but not knowing exactly where. One person apparently not as concerned with Patty Joe's whereabouts, her husband Rick. Three months after the disappearance, he leaves town, moves to southwestern Virginia, and literally never looks back. You know, he didn't start it all over again up there, a new life. Um, I never heard again from him. Never called, asked me how the case was going or anything. So he sort of forgot about me, uh, but I didn't forget about him. Detective Isom believes Pastor Pulley to be his killer. The problem, without a body, there is no case to be made for murder. I just need a body. You know, I've got all the circumstantial evidence together, and once you put the, the pieces of the puzzle together, you've got a picture. But until I've got that body, then the picture's there. But the most important element is missing, and that's the crime. For three years, Patty Jo Pulley has lived among the missing. Then in December 2002, a project geologist takes a walk under a bridge, one that places Patty Jo forever among the dead. As I was just working, you know, I just heard something crunch under my foot. And my first impression, my first thought was, well, I stepped on a, you know, skeleton of a deer. Uh, but then when I looked down, and I noticed that there was a, a bra. Because I didn't see a skull or anything like that. It was just bones and what appeared to be a bra across the bones. So the mass of the skeletal remains was in this area right here. That's correct. Investigators arrive and begin to process the scene. We conducted an excavation of the skeletal remains um, and successfully recovered uh, in excess of 95% of the skeletal remains, which is very uncommon. Once we got, it, got down to where the entire skeletal was, was visible, um, we began photographing, began searching for other physical evidence. Scraps of clothing, as well as dental records, confirmed the remains to be those of Pulley. A length of rope tells investigators Patty Joe was murdered. This was very crucial, and what this indicated was uh, the possibility of potential uh, binding of the victim or, or possibly being used as a weapon uh, for strangulation purposes. The recovery of the remains, the ropes that were found with the remains, basically led from a missing person case from Virginia evolving into a homicide investigation for North Carolina. Investigation's license. You're sort of disappointed that, that she's dead, but it's a relief now that uh, you can go ahead with it. Detective Keith Isom worked the original missing persons case and gets cold case detectives up to speed. I took everything I had, everyone I'd interviewed, every tape I had, every photograph, and handed it to them, said, here's the case, go through the case, and you'll see the puzzle, you can put it together. I think the photographs that were taken by the investigators from the Pennsylvania County Sheriff's Department were clearly one of the most crucial pieces of evidence in the case. Uh, These pictures, taken a day after Patty Joe disappeared, are of deep scratches found on the face, arm, and chest of Patty Joe's husband, Rick Pulley, longtime suspect in a missing person case, now turned murder. We were of the opinion that, that their theory that Mr. Pulley appeared to be involved was correct. He had uh, three uh, scrapes or scratches on his left cheek. In 1999, Rick Pulley told investigators that cuts on his face came from a fall into a thicket of briars were somewhat rectangular, slightly linear. And a forensic sort of... pathologist at Wake Forest University, Dr. Patrick Lance, evaluates that possibility. So I just went out and just sort of thrust my arm into uh, a briar patch to see what would happen. And of course, like most people would know, I got some superficial scratches on my forearm. And with a, enough effort, you might actually get one to bleed, but for the most part, these are fairly linear. They're more irregular, not, not nearly as wide as the, the injuries we saw in Mr. Pulley's cheek and face. Dr. Lentz's findings helped to explode Pulley's story about a fall into a briar patch. With the discovery of Patty Joe's body, detectives believe they have enough to charge Rick Pulley. Now they have to find him. 
it's like a place you would go if you wanted to hide and get away, you know, not be found. Connie Winslow is Patty Jo Pulley's niece. For nearly three years, Winslow has kept tabs on Rick Pulley, tracking him to the small town of Lebanon, Virginia. I begged him to please just tell me where she is, and he kept saying, I don't know where she's at, you know, I did not do anything to her. In Lebanon, Rick Pulley has again become a church leader and a trusted member of the community. Connie Winslow, however, refuses to let him walk away. I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I just want you to have one last thing to remember our family by. And I slapped him so hard, so hard. But that, believe it or not, made me feel so much better. We found that uh, Mr. Pulley was at, uh, at his work, which is at this residence right here is where he was doing his counseling at at that time. In February of 2003, Rick Pulley gets a second visit from his past. This time, it is in the form of the local chief of police with a warrant for the pastor's arrest. When I got here, found him alone and very cooperative. And I went ahead and transported him up to the sheriff's office where the detectives waited to question him. This here was when we went to pick up Rick in Lebanon. Um, this is what he looked like when he was sitting in the jail in the holding cell. In four short years, Rick Pulley has changed from a brown-haired young man of 43 to a white-haired shell at 47. Detective Isom chalks it up to the corrosive effect of guilt. We all have consciences, and no matter how we may want to portray ourselves one way, uh, there's always a little something inside that eats on us. The guilt that has gnawed on Rick Pulley is finally realized in the form of a set of cuffs and a ride back to North Carolina to await trial for murder. This life which is left in the form of a skull and bones and restraints all came from this beautiful woman. At trial, Caswell County District Attorney Joel Brewer tells the story of the perfect marriage, which somehow took a wrong turn to murder. She's working cleaning houses to try to make ends meet, and he's making telephone sex calls and running up huge telephone bills. The DA doesn't have DNA or fingerprints. What he does have, the gashes on Rick Pulley's face, scratching out the identity of a killer. We told the jury at the beginning of our final argument that in Genesis, the Lord set a mark on Cain. And then we began to explain to the jury how the mark was set upon Ricky Pulley by Patty Joe, and what this told Keith Isom. And, and pretty much the best witness on the whole thing was Patty Joe, to where she left a mark on Rick's face and his body. Because if it had not been for that, it's a good possibility he'd have got away with murder. On October 29th, 2004, Rick Pulley is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. It's justice for Patty Joe, And now the family, even though they always miss her, um, there's some type of closure. You gonna put it on the road side or this side? On a cold January morning, the family of Patty Jo Pulley places a cross near the bridge where her remains were found. Well, Try it, hit it on that side another time, too. We let her lay there three and a half years, and he knew where she was, and we didn't. She was our baby, and we had a lot of good times, didn't we, Rita? I didn't want the death penalty for him. I thought it would be too easy. Um, I think knowing him and the type of person he is, what he has now, life in prison without parole, is exactly what he needs. It's the worst thing for him.